dialogue, design, animation, and annotation. NPCs fill the worlds of our favorite video games in a multitude of ways. I happen to like people watching in games, and I also like virtual photography, aka the use of in-game photo modes and camera tools to frame and compose interesting shots. So at the intersection of those two things, I've been photographing NPCs as my subjects of interest for some time now. I talk to them when I can, follow them around, and I imagine what their lives might be like. I pay extra attention to their clothing, character design, behavior patterns that I think might go unnoticed by the average player. And here's what I learned. In... Guardians of the Galaxy's photo mode is pretty great, with all the bells and whistles you might expect, and then some. Its galaxy is beautifully lit, and the camera has a lot of range to move around it. Not to mention the precise depth of field slider, the filters, those frames? Following in the tradition of Insomniac Spider-Man before it, Eidos Montreal includes comic book covers as frame options. All five main characters are fully posable, with an option to have them look at the camera and or alter their facial expressions. Combined with the game's wide array of environments, both exterior and interior, this gives you a decent amount of room to use photo mode as a diorama mode, with the right kind of blocking. It's pretty dynamic, but you're not here for the Guardians, are you? You're here for everyone else. Eidos Montreal's take on these lovable misfits mostly uses the James Gunn lineup from the films, but they have introduced a new, completely original character to the mix, a space llama named Cammy. In their last game, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the photo mode let you pose Lara Croft in various ways as well, but there was always a particularly silly one. It was a pose called Llama Croft, and it turned her into… well, with the introduction of Cammy, I'm led to believe the folks at Eidos Montreal are using llamas as a recurring in-joke in their games, or at least a way of leaving a silly little signature behind from their team. Cammy usually just lounges about the ship, but depending on whether you have the music playing, she might sit still. An honest mistake. Do they look alike? Let's see. She's a biped, so no. Or rock her body a little bit. It's a fun touch. You encounter friendly NPCs in the Nova Corps ship, Lady Hellbender's Fortress, and the city in Nowhere, but I'm mainly going to focus on Nowhere because it features the most variety. Besides, in the other locations, the local character models are designed as enemies first. They eventually turn hostile. Hold on to that detail though, it'll come up again. You can see some of the aliens from nowhere at the entrance to Hellbender's Fortress though. They had the same idea the Guardians did, to sell whatever rare animals they've captured to her. We see them standing around with small cages, pleading to the enforcers to consider their offer. I used photo mode to get my camera inside one of the cages, but it seems like they're facades, completely empty inside. I do appreciate the little slot to breathe through though. These enforcers, who the subtitles call Hellraisers, have some really cool designs that I can't help but highlight. Although it's dark in this corridor, you can use filters to get some detailed views of their skeletal helmets some of which have spine-like strands trailing out the back. A few of their eyes glow red. The game's art director was Bruno Gauthier Leblanc, and lead character artist Genchi Buscelli has posted some renders of these Hellraisers on his art station. Senior concept artist Nicolas Lizote has also posted some concepts and calls them galactic poachers. We can see their clothes have fairly detailed patterns and look like they're made of leather. Have a look. All in all, these enemies look like seasoned warriors, with attire fashioned around wasteland scraps and battle trophies. Which they are. On to Planet Nowhere. The city here is buzzing with life and ambient dialogue, and is the main attraction for our purposes. I'm a huge fan of the fact that here, while surrounded by friendly NPCs, hitting R2 on your controller, which you normally use to shoot your weapon, causes Star-Lord to start firing off finger guns and making pew pew noises with his mouth instead. I won't lie, it gave me a good chuckle. You're greeted at the entrance by these armored security officers, who have bulky yet surprisingly intricate designs. Almost every piece of their armor has some kind of label, symbol, or insignia on it. For instance, take their boots. 
which have demarcated toes with these little arrows printed on them, pointing down at the floor. I guess this signifies their boots should be on the ground? I don't know, maybe that kind of label makes more sense when you live in space. Moving up, their helmets have these markings that resemble a numbering system on them, printed on the horns. These symbols remind me of an analog clock, which the icon on their forehead is also fashioned after. We see a similar symbol on these officers too. These guys seem to be a bit more talkative. Two of them question Peter about his ship, the Milano, and one even asks where Yondu might be. You know Yondu? Used to, long time ago, before he got sent to the kiln. Heard one of his own crew turned him in. Yeah, that life catches up to everyone eventually. Here by the landing pad, you can also see civilians who've just arrived, bright-eyed and eager to enjoy the sights right by a giant neon sign that says, Welcome to Nowhere. And civilians about to leave, tired and complaining about how what happens in nowhere stays in nowhere. I appreciate this kind of contrast. One particularly interesting pair talks about how their vacation here was a success, at first, but they fear they overstayed the honeymoon period. In their own words, this city has a way of getting under your suit. I love the specificity of the writing here. That turn of phrase, getting under your suit, goes perfectly with the character saying it, as they don't have skin to speak of. They're a disembodied octopus head in a fishbowl attached to a suit. There are a few others like them, and I notice they have these little pipes that connect the fishbowl head to the rest of the suit. Presumably, it's how they pilot the body. You can even take photo mode inside their fishbowl to try and see the world through their lens which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but it is a testament to how bizarrely photo mode lets you act in a game about bizarre things. Their travel companion is shorter, has a single eyeball, and seems to be wearing some kind of hoodie. You'll see more of these types of aliens throughout the city later as well, in various recolors. Guardians of the Galaxy isn't afraid to get weird with how their NPC designs look, which is fitting and awesome considering the spacefaring fantasy IP it's adapting. Later into the game, the Guardians are freaked out by the lack of a head on a Marvel character they meet named Ruby Thursday, but this conversation didn't really work for me after having seen far weirder and more experimental designs on Nowhere. I'd imagine it's something the crew would be more used to by now. For the most part, Thursday herself has a body that's extremely humanoid, with even her hands having a pale complexion. It's just not that weird. Back on Nowhere, you'll also find these strange, almost featureless humanoid aliens hanging around, each of whom is a single color, but with various bangles, headpieces, and distinct clothing choices to distinguish them. Have a look. Maybe even have a listen. I'm just following company policy. What did you just say? My father died fighting those bastards. You'll notice that the captions for ambient dialogue are off to the side of the screen, which I've always liked. It leaves the usual space for subtitles for your party members to take up, and mimics how these other exchanges are supposed to be things you hear in passing. Now, as much as I love admiring character design, this is Guardians of the Galaxy. It would be a disservice not to talk about the sound design of Nowhere too. You might say it's an awesome mix. I will say it's a truly dynamic soundscape, and luckily we have a GDC talk by senior audio director Steve Shepkowski to illuminate how they brought it to life. We, I knew one of the maps we were visiting in the game was Nowhere, and I wanted that, that credible Star Wars feeling um, to anywhere we had aliens in the game. I just felt Star, Lord, Star Wars was the bar we were aiming for. Shepkowski mentions using the Star Wars cantina scene as a reference, as that was the ambiance he wanted to capture. But the first few voiceover artists he met with weren't quite right for the project. But then he found something interesting. So how was I going to create what I had in my head? Well, thankfully, the universe delivered to me 
the Monster Factory, or La Fabrique de Monstres. And what this is, is it's a local troupe made of death metal singers that actually has uh, singers, they're based here, but they have singers all over the world. And these are people that can do very um, aggressive things with their voices that normal actors probably wouldn't want to do. So it was a very uh, interesting concept to me. So I met with their head monster, which was Sebastian Crato. He's the head of the company. And we would meet weekly and discuss ideas and see if there was a good creative fit. The use of a death metal troupe to create this kind of soundscape is, dare I say it, metal as hell. And I love it. The sound team was committed to highlighting the alienness of this place, and making sure we wouldn't just hear a bunch of different, quote unquote, exotic accents in English. No, we would hear truly bizarre sounds, and Shepkowski used a spreadsheet to keep track of the various alien races, and what kinds of sounds they would make. Would they speak in clicks, grunts, growls, or English with a twist? Then, based on that spreadsheet, he went about casting the appropriate vocalists from the Monster Factory. This also means that Shepkowski has some really interesting insight on each of the alien races we've looked at so far, and we can see the names the studio gave to them in their documents. For instance, the fishbowl alien is an all-female race called the Sirons, seemingly named after the Sirens of Greek myth, as they're described as being able to use their voices to manipulate others. There's an allure to them that is meant to contrast how strange their faces look. We can see that allure at play in some optional dialogue. One gets Peter to agree to a date later, fairly easily if you talk to her. If I see you again later, I'll buy you a drink. Hmm, it's a date. The Sirons don't have bodies, just suits. So unlike the other aliens, they don't wear shoes. Their suits just have these bulky hoofs at the bottom. The single-colored humanoid aliens are called Kungu, and are described as spiritual, generally peaceful, and laid-back, if a little lazy. They're said to often travel with other companions. Something fun I noted is that their official name seems to be the Kungu, but in-house, the devs called them Jubjubman. Completely coincidentally, the word Jubjub has a special significance in James Gunn's more recent Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Senior concept artist Nicholas Francoeur has some more concepts for the Kungu, Jubjub, Jujubi, whatever you want to call them, on his art station. And we actually have Francoeur to thank for a lot of these NPC designs. We can see just how many styles he experimented with, including several that didn't make the cut, and several that did. Among those who made it, we have these reptilian-looking aliens with heads shaped like hammerhead sharks. And these blue ones without eyes or facial features, who have jagged, almost crystalline heads. The hammerhead aliens have fairly sharp teeth, and these webbed red markings down their necks. When they're wearing shorter sleeves, we can see some spots on their shoulders too. I like how the team seems to pull inspiration from aquatic animals, mammals, and minerals in the earth, and remixes them in interesting ways. Francoeur's designs also include these street vendors, who look like large birds with teeth in place of beaks. And in-game, you can see how the fin and tentacle on their heads jiggle as they move. Again, not afraid to get weird. Oh, we'll stop that exotic meals from as far away as Mac This final model was worked on by Emmanuel Le Coutrier, who credits the pants and boots to their external partners. Returning to Shepkowski's presentation, these nowhere workers are called the Lisko, and they're fluent in English, as we've already seen. And finally, these four-horned aliens are called the Moko, or Iguanor. They're said to be formidable warriors, good with heat. There are some things concepts and labels can't tell you though, and that's where our photo mode studies come in. Depending on the length of the sleeve a Moko is wearing, you're able to notice these dark lines and shapes and colors that twine around their arms, down to the fingertips. I liked this little touch quite a bit, and also appreciated the more formal robes they're sometimes wearing. Moving up, we see the bottom portion of these aliens' robes can have some pretty nicely designed patterns on them. Here, you'll spy a pattern resembling a leopard print as this alien reaches their arm to the sky. Their eyes are an aquamarine blue, and they have little fuzzy tufts of hair coming out of their ears, as well as some subtle stripes on the horns. Shipkowski doesn't show info on these ones with antlers shaped like petals, and what appears to be a cheeky bucktooth smile on their faces, 
whose designs I quite liked too. They seem more casual compared to the others and are usually wearing t-shirts or informal wear. You might notice that their fingertips are colored differently from the rest of their hands. At the spaceport, we can see quite a few of them working as smugglers, with animals in cages. Or scrapyard speeders they're trying to flip. I don't want to stereotype them as mischievous troublemakers, obviously, but I should mention that there's a point in the game when one shows up in a security guard uniform and misleads Peter to go towards a trap. Hindsight is 2020, I guess. But he looks very out of place in that uniform if you've been paying attention to how they usually present. See soon. Nowhere security. Super official. These exchanges also highlight one other fun difference between the residents who live here and the travelers who've come for pleasure. The residents are a lot more savvy about Nowhere's customs. They know when to quit or to cash out. And one traveler finds out the hard way he gambled just one game too many. Lastly, I'll call attention to their props at the spaceport too. The suitcases the travelers are carrying aren't all the same and have different colors and different patterns on them. It's a cool touch. Let's leave the spaceport behind now, and look more closely at the city proper. The first area you enter into is called Seer Alley, and we can see this concept art by Matthew Chevalier stunningly realized in the game. Chevalier worked on a lot of the stalls and shops here, and we're able to see just how densely populated this bazaar is. NPCs crowd around these various shops, haggle, get refused business for not looking evolved enough. Check it out. The pool of costumes here are as diverse as the alien races themselves are. We have everything from t-shirts to sweatshirts, to fur coats, to bulky pieces of armor, to Novacore uniform. Although most of the aliens have original designs, Nowhere does also feature several Kree from the comics. They just look human with blue skin, and can be seen conspiring in the bar together, or wandering the streets by the Emporium. There's a Kree officer there who looks like he's Novacore, which I thought was cool and a little bit unique. The city itself is vibrant, with giant neon signs and lights posted everywhere, and puddles of rain left on the streets. In fact, there's so much going on that my photo mode had some trouble with the focus distance at one point. I suspect part of this has to do with how the Rift, an important location in the city that I'll circle back to, is depicted in the background. It's this giant starry expanse. But there's this straight line cutting down between the shades of blue that makes the graphic look like it's been folded open. Even then, I found this way of seeing the city to be quite charming. Nowhere's geography is layered and atmospheric and distinctive, with each area demarcated with different makeups of NPCs. In the seedier alleyways, for instance, you can see colorful graffiti and these alien space rodents scurrying across the floors. They're barely on screen for a second, but they have this fairly detailed, fluffy quality to them. Near the shopping districts, you can overhear one vendor adjust their marketing tactics based on what species of alien they're seeing. They recognize Peter as Terran and adjust their speech accordingly. Most of the NPCs on Nowhere are adults, but you can play with some kids out here too. Except they'll run past you and pickpocket some of your units if you do. Finally, in the local bar, which is basked in bright red and gold light, you see this horrifying bartender with an awesome, unique design, who insists on giving you a drink. You want something to wash it down? I really like his gravelly voice and these small growths hanging around his neck and arms. Behind, you can get a view of the wide array of bottles he keeps on display too. There's some cool alien labels on them, and there's a lot of variation in how they're shaped, with multicolored liquids that look great in this lighting. One of the labels even has an icon with that analog numbering system we saw earlier. Thanks to the generously flexible photo mode, we can slide down the table and notice the menus, the red drinks, the various other patrons and workers caught in conversations.
we can see patrons dancing the night away, and in the darkest corners, smugglers planning their next heists. Outside, there's one neon sign that's advertising some kind of food that resembles a mix between pasta, noodles, and pizza. For what it's worth, the Guardians themselves hype up the noodles in nowhere, but the street noodles you can get look different from what's shown on the sign. I'd say this item being advertised looks more like a deep fried pie with noodles stuffed inside. It does appear out in the world too. You can see some of the local workers enjoying it to go, while others have what appears to be Asian-inspired takeout. In addition to these foods that borrow from existing Earth cuisines, we can also see some stranger, more alien meals at the vendor's shop, like these kebabs that barely resemble kebabs, and these uncooked bugs in his backroom kitchens. Here's a taste. I'm going to talk about story spoilers now, so this is a good place to stop, if you're interested and yet to play the game for yourself. What I'll highlight about Seer Alley is that it's largely made up of fortune tellers, and customers anxious to learn their futures. As glamorous as the city appears to be, it's still a fairly seedy place, and its people are both hedonistic and, somehow, existentially terrified. Here we're seeing this in the city's very commerce. A more spiritual variation of this can be seen near the Rift, a massive vortex at the edge of nowhere. It's said that the universe may have begun at the Rift. It's said that anyone who tries to approach it is never seen again. Many things are said, really. In one of the game's best scenes, Drax gazes into the Rift and laments that his late wife and child might be there, instead of the Katathian afterlife, because they died tragic and unremarkable deaths. He comes here to gaze into it, to sit with his grief, and we see a lot of NPCs holding each other close and doing the same. There's a dread in nowhere. It's situated near this massive, mysterious site no one quite understands, but everyone respects. There's regret. Aw, does my cute little video about NPCs have an essayistic thesis? You bet it does. Because the thing that fascinates me about Guardians as NPCs is that a large majority of the friendly ones are reused for the enemy models, except in new uniforms given to them by the game's cultish antagonists, the Universal Church of Truth. And when taking everything about Nowhere's design and dialogue into account, this is genuinely narratively compelling. See, the Universal Church of Truth's goal is to spread something called The Promise, which grants everyone their own ideal life in a bubble reality safe inside their dreams. For example, Peter's promise includes his mother still being alive, and the Guardians being his friends in his ideal life on Earth. Drax's promise involves his wife and daughter still being alive. In essence, the promise undoes your deepest regrets, and solves whatever existential dilemmas you may be reckoning with. So is it any surprise that the citizens of a place like Nowhere, where they gather to gaze at the rift, and pay real units to hear their futures foretold by scammers, could be so taken in by this simple, almost perfect solution. Cults recruit vulnerable people. And for all their sketchiness, the civilians of Nowhere are as vulnerable as they come. Here, you can see me fighting some of them as enemies, and you'll notice the familiar faces and models up close in photo mode. It's just these red cult outfits that are different. The Guardians even comment on these new outfits sometimes while in the heat of battle. And I understand, the faces or models are being reused to save resources, but it just makes so much sense given where they come from. After walking through Seer Alley and witnessing the mass mourning at the Rift, this little detail adds to the story and is the kind of thing I just live for, you know? I fully understand why a civilian from nowhere would be so enamored by the promise. In understanding that, I also see how recycling character models between friendlies and enemies can be made meaningful. 
There's a deceased NPC you can find named Janlo Bucks, who wrote in their last moments that they were a performer on Nowhere, completely taken in by the promise. Once the Universal Church of Truth handed them real weapons, though, they felt wrong. The guns felt different from the prop guns they were used to holding, so they hid themselves away in a cave and just died there. It's where you find them in their last memo. The place and circumstances under which you find this collectible says as much about the story as the story spelt out in the collectible itself. While fighting the other cultists, I also peered down at the huddled masses who were gathered around the promise outside of the frame, far below the platforms we were on. These are obviously not supposed to be seen up close, but they caught my eye. They weren't quite flat and two-dimensional as I'd been expecting, but they weren't low-polygon 3D models either. The closer you look, the more they look like paper craft. Like pieces of origami, with flat axes folded apart in a way that suggests a three-dimensional shape. They're all A-posing too, and wobbling back and forth to look like they're animated. It's a pretty cool approach, and the effect works well from the intended distance. Earlier I mentioned that Nova Corps becomes enemies later into the game too, and it's for the same reason. The Church and their promise take over their entire ship. I won't spend as much time on them, but here's a gallery of their uniforms in photo mode. The planet Lamentis also features some friendly civilians, but they only really appear in cutscenes. That said, the Lamentis kids were modeled and created by assistant art director Taisha Abdulina, and we can see them more closely on her art station portfolio. Abdulina also worked on Drax's late daughter, Kamaria, and she writes that Kamaria's intricate hairstyle was one of her favorite things she got to do. Her favorite character she worked on, though, is Mantis who essentially acts as the sixth member of the Guardian's crew. One interesting thing I noticed with Mantis in photo mode is that the tassels at the bottom of her robe flap whenever you move the camera around. In fact, this seemed to be a recurring theme with capes and similar fabrics. Back to Nowhere. Although most of these street signs are written in an alien language, we do see some in-universe English text on occasion. This includes the labels on the food you can purchase, presumably for the player's benefit, so we know what we're getting into. It also includes the giant sign for the Collector's Emporium for a similar reason, and an advertisement for the Nowhere Lottery. This last one's the most narratively interesting. It includes just one of several possible vending machines, which features musician Lila Shenny, a character from the comics who originates on Earth, and often ends up in space. Like with Peter Quill himself, I see her as having been part of how the language came to be known throughout space. Finally, I appreciate how much consideration the developers have given to living spaces in this game. On your ship, the Milano, you're able to drop in on each of your party members' rooms, and closer looks reveal that there's work done to maintain continuity as you progress throughout the game. For instance, Drax usually leaves a book lying around on his bed, but sometimes when he's actually reading the book in the living room, you won't see it in its usual spot. His room also has a portrait of his late wife and daughter in it. Gamora's room has a bunch of dolls in it, and the game expands on why she's working on this collection later. She, too, sometimes leaves a book lying around on her bed. I need to clear my mind. This book is not helping. If you need a recommendation, I just finished the World Mind's postmortem on ineffective planetary scale battle tactics of the Galactic War. What part of this would help clear my mind? None. It's very upsetting to read. My favorite detail about Groot is that as a flora colossi, or a tree in layperson terms, he not only waters the team's plants, but drinks out of the watering can himself? Hats off to whatever animator planted that one. Rocket's desk has a diagram of his final unlockable outfit on it, as well as a memo to the person he's commissioned to design it, which foreshadows the ending. These uniforms are eventually realized just in time for the final mission of the game. My favorite instance of this actually takes place during the ending. Again, spoilers. 
So, the game features a character named Nikki, who also appears in the comics. In her private quarters at the start of the game, you're able to see a bunch of little robots with faces painted over them, as they're the only friends she really has. They're kind of my friends, I guess. I reprogrammed most of them. And gave them faces. Maybe. No, I mean it's cool. Gives them personality. Very cool. She's a pretty good artist, as you can see here. As the game progresses and she bonds with Quill, who her mother Corel once dated, Quill starts to suspect he may be her father. It turns out, Nikki is fond of that idea too. Her promise, her ideal life, is one in which she, Corel, and Quill share a home as a typical family together. It's all in her imagination, of course, but if you take photo mode around her new imagined bedroom, you can find both alien books scrawled in fictional languages, and old RPG manuals, in very clear English. You originally see these manuals in Peter's childhood bedroom in the flashbacks. In other words, Nikki's perfect life involves being in touch with her human roots and her father's interests, in addition to the space and stars she's been raised amongst by her mother. It's sweet. The cynic in me thinks, okay, so... This book is a recycled asset, but the writer and the photographer in me, who's noticed how much attention the team has paid to script supervision, to continuity, can't help but think, nothing is placed without thought. Maybe my interpretation of this book being here is a stretch, but its placement isn't an accident. The props in these rooms were placed by a level designer, a programmer, a person. And Nikki is one of the game's principal characters, so these details matter. Upon defeating the final boss and breaking the illusion of the promise, the Guardians power walk down a hallway together, and we get our best looks at a lot of the aliens as they do, since the lighting here is much brighter and more vibrant than in the streets of nowhere. They're celebrating the Guardians' victory, so you see them dancing, or playing air guitar, and just having a great time against this starry blue sky. I'll let you see some of the dance animations in the background before we move on. As you can see, the camera is locked in front of our party, so you're only really seeing what's behind them. But fortunately, photo mode lets you see what's ahead too. Functionally, this breaks the game a little bit, as you're viewing characters you're not supposed to see yet. I found that some of the NPCs who were still ahead were A-posing, as the game hadn't loaded their dance animations yet. I also spoiled some of the cutscenes for myself. You're greeted by some of the game's major characters as you resume your walk, and here I have some close-ups of Cosmo and his puppies, who are some of the best-looking dogs I've ever seen in a video game. As well as Lady Hellbender, whose sharp claws, armor, and hoof-like boots I hadn't really gotten this good a look at before, since her primary appearances had been in cutscenes. Her suit in the comics isn't quite as bulky, and senior concept artist Frederick Bennett states he designed it this way, fashioned out of monster parts, as an homage to Monster Hunter. The modelers have translated his concept art into a perfect render, right down to the bulging veins in her arms and legs. It's the kind of detail I might expect in cinematics, but was really impressed to see on an in-game model. Hellbender isn't canonically on this walkway before you meet her, by the way. The game has just loaded her model in early. She makes her entrance in a cutscene only after you pass a certain threshold. Finally, Mantis's model spawns at the end of the corridor, cloaked completely in shadow. But she isn't supposed to be here either. Again, in the intended cutscene, she arrives after you reach the end of the corridor. Across this whole sequence, photo mode is essentially working as a way to poke the camera out of bounds. And I'm surprised. Grateful, mind you, but still surprised that Eidos Montreal lets you. All in all, I enjoyed their take on these lovable misfits and deeply appreciated the range on their photo mode. Admittedly, I wasn't a fan of all the game's gameplay decisions, but my enjoyment of the world was enhanced immensely by the level of depth and character in Nowhere, by the enemy designs matching what the story was telling me. Because, like the soundscape it sings with, it was telling me volumes. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching that. This video is actually part of a series in which I look at NPCs and even more games that pique my interest. I also make video essays about games, movies, and all that good stuff. So if you like my work, consider subscribing. Last but not least, I've included links to the social media pages where I post my photos, down below in the description. Juxtaposed with my photos, you might find some short stories I've come up with about the various NPCs I've looked at. Until next time! Remember that every stranger on the streets got a story, and every story can only get stranger.